Contrera. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. It's really great to have you here on the Queer Hustle Summit. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I have been wanting to talk to you about this for so long. I think we spoke, <laughs> like, what, when did we even speak? It was around before New, New York's Queer Hustle. Yeah, I think, I think that was when we talked about this. And so, yeah. so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be sharing, sharing my ideas with you guys. Yeah, it's really great to have you. And this topic is, um, I mean, obviously such a popular one. You probably get asked about it nonstop. <laughs> Um, but TEDx is what we're going to be covering today, all about TEDx. But first, if you wouldn't mind giving our listeners a bit of a brief summary of you and what you do in the world. Sure. Uh, so I uh, have my own digital uh, sort of full service digital marketing firm um, here in Brooklyn, New York. By day, I'm an entrepreneur. By night, I'm a creative person. So I come from uh, a creative background. And when I started my business, um, I... I still wanted to be creative in some way. And so um, one of those ways, kind of by accident, um, ended up being, uh, being involved with TEDx and uh, helping speakers prepare their ideas, pitching them, uh, helping them prepare their talks, et cetera. I've, I've been a TEDx speaker myself um, twice in 2018. I, I gave uh, two talks within two weeks. Um, oh. Yeah, so I don't recommend doing them that soon because <laughs> um, you'll go crazy, uh, which which I did. I went a little nuts, um, but um, I really wanted to walk my talk because I was working with people who um, were giving TEDx talks and wanted to give TEDx talks. Um, I've also been a TEDx organizer, um, and I've I've written a book about the TEDx process, and and uh, and I work with lots of people, getting them placed on stages and working on their ideas and their talks. Super cool. Could not mm -hmm. talk to anyone more qualified to talk about TED stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> um, so firstly, how, how did you, I mean, you kind of alluded to a little bit, but how did you get started even speaking? Like what led you down this path? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. So uh, you and I both know uh, Dory Clark. Uh, Dory Clark's a really long, long time friend of mine. She spoke at last year's uh, Queer Hustle. Um, Love her. So yeah, she's amazing. And um, I'm not convinced she's not a wizard. Um, <laughs> so uh, she, she knew me when I was a musician. Um, I, I was a jazz musician living in New York and I was really broke and really burned out. Um, and she was like, well, you could be a virtual assistant. I was like, what's that? What does that mean? And, and then I figured, well, not much to lose, right? I was making less than 15 grand a year as a musician. Um, and so I, I did that. I started uh, being a virtual assistant and then people started coming to me for certain things. Um, and at the time it was mostly podcast bookings and, and uh, social media. And then Dory said, I have a client who wants to get pitched for TEDx. She said, um, see if you could do this. And so the client came to me and I said, no guarantees. Let's try this for a month. I'll pitch you. Um, I had had a lot of success pitching in, pod, in the podcast realm um, and so I said, well, I'll try it. And within, um, a month he had gotten two invitations. And so, uh, after that people started coming to me and saying, Hey, can you do that for me too? And I kept saying no guarantees and then they got placed. And, you know, so, um, over time I started learning more about what TEDx actually was. And, you know, um, I realized that if I was really going to get anywhere in this business, I had to do my own talks. And, and so I got really creative with my ideas. One, uh, one of my talks was on um, jazz music and innovation. And the other talk was about exercise and earning potential. And so I, I really wanted to test the model of what an idea worth spreading was, which is Ted, uh, Ted and TEDx's um, mission statement, idea worth spreading. So uh, that's sort of how I got started. That's that's the long the long answer of how I got started here. That is such a cool story. Thanks. <laughs> like, congrats for figuring out. You know, like what I really like about that is so many people wait until they have certainty on something, right? right. It's like, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to learn how I can book stuff first, and then I'll get a client. And right. They usually don't even bother doing it. But you were like, yeah. no guarantees. Let's give this a go. Right. Yeah, I love right. that attitude. I love it. So let me ask you, um, and this may be like a basic question, but why would somebody do a TED talk in the first place? What do they get out of it? 
That's a great question. So um, a lot of people come to me and they say, oh, that's so cool. I want to put that on my bucket list. And mm. the truth is that TED, TEDx, that red circle, right? Standing on a stage with the TEDx or TED, or if you're lucky enough, TED proper, mm. right? Mm. With that logo behind you, that's arguably the best thing you can do for your credibility as somebody who works with ideas for a living, whether you're an entrepreneur, an author, a creative person, an executive, whatever the case is, if you work with ideas for a living, there's probably a TED talk in you, right? And so um, I, I say this being an author and being someone who works with authors and someone who respects authors very, very much, people are more likely to watch your TED talk than buy your book. Mm. So, if you can have a really easy, simple entry point to people who don't already know you, and on top of that, you have that kind of credibility that comes with the TEDx and TED brand, then, you know, then people are more likely to buy your book, pay for your services, work with you. You know, it, it's a way in that builds trust right away. I love it. So it's the ultimate credibility. Exactly. Perfect. But now we've got this whole quarantine thing happening and it's mental mm -hmm. and no one knows what's going on. Is there, is your business paused or how is it working right now? So that's a good question. Um, and I, for, for a while, I didn't know the answer, right? When this all happened, I was like, what's going to speaking, speaking engagements are going away. What's going to happen to my business? Mm -hmm. You know, cause this is, um, about a third of what we do every day. Mm -hmm. So, um, but TED is being really great. They're um, extending any um, licenses. So what happens is when a TEDx organizer wants to do their event, they apply for a license. And usually you have to put it on within a certain amount of time. Do and you so know how, how much it is or how much time you get? Um, it depends on the kind of event that you do. So for, um, I, I think for uh, TED, TEDx, like a general TEDx, it's um, probably a calendar year. But um, I did a TEDx Women, and that you have to do in between November 1st and December 15th. So, because okay. uh, that's when the TEDx Women events happen. Okay. Because that's also when TED Women happens. Um, so, um, they're extending all licenses, mm. um, which is really great because a lot of people are now saying, well, my event was going to be in June. I'm going to have it in October or December or early 20, 2021. So it's actually a really great time <laughs> to be thinking about TEDx, um, which, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure about other speaking engagements, but that's kind of one of those things that's special about TED. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so they're extending their licenses. So that means that you could, whenever this is over, you could still do your talk if you had one booked. Yeah. Right? And you can continue applying, right? And you can, you've got more time mm -hmm. to apply. Exactly. Um, so, so let's talk about when you're thinking about applying. I mean, everyone, like you said, if it's on everyone's bucket list, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It's on my bucket list. I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> so um, how, what's the best way to prepare? I mean, yeah, you can just send in an application, but that's, I always shy away from that because you're not setting yourself apart. So right. I guess two questions, I suppose. What's mm -hmm. the way to mentally and physically prepare yourself to do something like this. And then I guess later on, let's, let's talk about the actual application stuff. That's great. Um, so the first thing is be prepared for rejection. And I don't mean, oh, you might get one or two or five rejections. Mm -hmm. I mean, be prepared for upwards of 50, mm -hmm. you know, and the reason I say that is because if you apply to one, chances are, your, the chance that your idea is going to fit in that theme, if you already had your idea um, and you know you want to talk on, I don't know, um, building online communities or whatever the case is, the chances that your idea is going to be the best one for that talk is small, mm -hmm. right? But if you cast a really wide net, the first thing is that it's a numbers game, right? So it, it's if you're willing to travel, if you're willing to put in the investment of time and energy and money into getting, getting into the event that fits you the best, 
that's going to take some effort. So really plan to do that many applications. And when we pitch people, we do that many applications. You know, we, we pitch over months time. Um, and the second thing is now, if you have an idea, spend five or 10 minutes thinking about how that idea fits a particular theme. So most TEDx organizers come up with a theme and they're, they're broad themes. They're, made and designed so that, for instance, your theme can fit a variety of topics. So you're not going to get any TEDx that's going to say their, their, um, their theme is math, right? They're not going to say, we're only doing math talks or we're only doing medicine, you know, um, well, that's not true. There's TED Med, but, um, you know, just as an example, like we're not only going to do science talks, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a, an example of a theme might be paradigm shift, and that's the theme that I used for my TEDx women. And um, the first application that I got was from somebody who um, I subsequently became one of my business partners. Um, I was so impressed by, I knew her, she, we were friends. Um, my theme was paradigm shift. I announced, she submitted a video to me within probably 12 hours. And she had crafted her idea around my theme. It was absolutely brilliant. It was, her talk was about if we want to change the paradigm, we have to change our language. And she referenced it in the video. She referenced it in, in her blurb, right? She even made it a part of my title. Now that's not always possible. That's not always possible, but if there's a way for you to right. connect your idea to the theme, you bring your mm -hmm. chances that much higher. Okay. So, um, yeah. and the opposite is true. Like, don't say this doesn't fit your theme, but you should still have, you know, you should still have me on your talk and here's why, right? Like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of experience, but as someone who runs an event, you know, right. and receives applications, it becomes really obvious really quick that most people are just, just spraying and praying, you know, yeah. it's mm -hmm. like, what are you, this is not, first of all, it's not relevant you know, right. My right. Topic at mm -hmm. all. You're just could apply for anything. Um, and second of all, usually the idea isn't, and we're going to go into the idea thing a bit later on, but mm -hmm. often people don't think it through or make it specific enough. Right. So it's super general and the number of, and I'm sure you've seen this too, like live a life you love. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, applications that you get is like, oh, like you have to have positioning for your brand right. and, you know, right. like for your, for your talk and for yourself and, yeah, I, um, I'm, what, actually, what are the issues or problems or the biggest things that you see that people do wrong when they are approaching any part of this? Mm, that's a great question. And I'm going to get up, up on my soapbox for a second. Do it, do it, do it. Because uh, <laughs> I've seen, I've seen the good, bad and the ugly, right? So yeah. you said, live the life you love. My favorite is mindfulness. And I have clients oh, yeah. to me all the time and say, I want to give a talk on mindfulness and I say you and Brene Brown. You know? yeah. <laughs> and if you do want to give a talk on something that's been talked about, like live the life you love or find your inner voice or, mm -hmm. you know, be more mindful every day or whatever the case is, go on the yeah. TEDx YouTube, watch mindfulness talks and see if you have, have anything to say that hasn't already been said, mm -hmm. you know, because I got to be honest with you. I got, probably five when I when I was doing my um my applications I got about five or six talks that were you know find your inner voice and they all got put in the no pile all of them because I was so tired of hearing about it that I just I, I didn't even want to watch those videos you know um second thing is um and this this kind of gets into the application I'll go into a little bit more detail when we get to it but for 95% of the uh, applications, organizers like to see a video of you talking about your idea. So, and this happened, this, this happened to me. I, I got a, um, a submission from a professional who I respect in other situations. And they said, I don't have the time to create a one minute video for you. Here's my 45 minute webinar. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> So you know, the organizer asks for something. If you can't do it, don't, don't apply. You know, um, that's, that's like 
you know, just I, disrespectful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, like, I mean, it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the other funny story that I often tell is um, I, I put on a TEDx Women, which is a women's event. And mm-hmm. had this um, man apply several times and he would send me, you know, emails and Facebook messages in the middle of the night saying that while he's not a man, he um, has raised four daughters and has four female cats so he can speak to women's issues. Please don't do that. Four female cats. (laughs) I mean, you know, this is a queer women's summit, but like, you know. Oh my God. That's, there's always one. Yeah. It's so funny. Okay. Yeah. Everybody stay away from all of that. Yeah. Um, Whoa. So, but you do, I mean, is, is it required to submit a video at the time that you're applying or is it just a thing that you should probably do? So um, that's a good question because every organizer is allowed to set up their um, parameters to whatever they want. Um, the one to two minute video is really common and that's, that's a loose number. So if you go to two and a half, it's fine. But, um, you know, so... And they, and they almost always want it to be an unedited webcam or iPhone video because they, they want to know that you didn't have to do anything fancy to say what you need to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I often advise my clients to just use a teleprompter app on their phone and just speak into it and, and, and read um, if, if they can do that, right? Or if they're really good at speaking off the cuff um, in the early stages, then they can, they're free to do that as well. But the teleprompter is a nice way to help you along with that, you know. So that's an investment of time. I say I usually have, I have my clients do that before we start pitching so that I have a video. And then if they need anything else, like if they, if, you know, some organizers will have you go to a second round or something like that and say submit another video or a longer video or whatever the case is, that's kind of um, more of a case-by-case basis. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense that they want to see you kind of in your natural habitat do, doing your thing. Um, exactly. Because people can, people can fake a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the last thing you want. Um, so in terms of we've got, we've got the video, you've got um, – I'm trying to think if I should ask you about the idea stuff now or if there's more prerequisites to beginning. Should we move on to the idea stuff? Yeah. Uh, the idea stuff is, it, you know, that's kind of a, it's funny because it's, it's the main right. thing, but it's also a little bit of a yeah. prerequisite, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, totally. All right. Let's yeah. do it. So, so wh- how do you know you've got a good idea? What makes a good idea? Um, a good idea and an idea worth spreading is something that's global, it's actionable, and it has strong takeaways. Okay. So a TED talk is not a motivational speech. And it's not something that speaks to only one demographic of people. Hmm. So it's kind of the opposite of a keynote. So um, if somebody comes to me and says, I have a TED talk and I only speak to executives or I only speak to women executives or I only speak to people who make over a certain amount of money. God bless you. That's not a TED talk. You know, you have to find a, a way to take that idea, whatever it is, and make it global. You want to make it so that it applies to everyone. Um, you also can't proselytize. So no religion, no politics. You can use examples. Like you can, you can use that stuff in your research, but you can't get up there and say, I hate Trump and here's why. <laughs> you know, um, uh, no pseudoscience. That's another one. So a lot of the like new age you know, things like essential oils and, 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 and anti-vaxxer ideas and things like that, that's not acceptable on a TED stage. Also, no mm. selling from the stage. So I advise people who have a book, not even to say, in my book, I talk about, talk about the research in your book, talk about the ideas in your book, but don't mention your book. Yep. People must have a hard time getting away from that. Some people have such a problem yeah. not mentioning <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. Some people do. It's funny, you know, um, cause we're so programmed, right? Like, especially if you're doing podcasts or something like that, um, or speaking on a keynote stage, it's, we reference our books all the time. We reference our services all the time. Right. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. 
Um, so you said something earlier when you said about your two talks, um, exercise and what was the Green other potential. one? Oh, and uh, jazz and Green innovation. Potential and jazz mm -hmm. and innovation, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing um, that I've been reading James Altucher for a long time, you probably know mm -hmm. James. Yeah. Um, so one thing he always talks about is idea sex and he always talks about adding two random things that don't really make sense together and creating a whole mm -hmm. new idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it interesting that both of your talks did that. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Is that something that you recommend or? Yeah. Um, so part of the reason that both of those talks were successful is because, um, because they were two unexpected links, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to find anybody that's going to talk about jazz, which is, you know, and, and business, right? So those, those two things aren't very often put together. So they were mm -hmm. unexpected and it was really easy for me to find a place for that talk. You know, same thing with exercise and money, right? Those two ideas are, are so sort of, um, they're, they're usually not thought of as related, right? Um, so totally. that made it a lot easier. If you can find a way to talk about two things that are, um, you know, not, not intuitive, that usually will ensure that you have a really good, uh, a really unique idea and something that nobody else can talk about. Yeah. I mean, that's a great strategy. I've used that mm -hmm. one in a couple of, a couple of ways in my own life. If you were to do a third Ted talk, would you use that strategy again? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, um, I actually almost had the opportunity to do a third TED talk. Um, but of course coronavirus happened and, and, you know, it's, it's postponed indefinitely, right? It, mm -hmm. It'll happen. We just don't know when. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I was thinking of it as kind of a prologue to the exercise talk. Um, so, um, I, I might use the same strategy if I, if I was going to start from scratch and, and apply, um, start mm -hmm. the application process all over again. I also think that makes for an, a more interesting talk. You know, it makes for an interesting mm -hmm. idea. Of course, it's not, it's not applicable to everybody, right? Like everybody's idea doesn't, isn't served by that, but that can be a really interesting way to find an entry point into a good idea. Yeah. That's one of the things that I actually talked about um, quite often when I was um, doing a lot of videos. Mm -hmm. on, on ideas and idea sex and that type of thing because um, it used to be that I would I would say setting yourself apart can you can't I can't really compete with entrepreneurs right I'm right. maybe the best right entrepreneur but I, I might be pretty close to the best lesbian entrepreneur right know? right Definitely <laughs> a much smaller pool <laughs> right pool, right exactly. so I'm like cool and what about what about a lesbian digital nomad entrepreneur I mean come on how mm -hmm. many of those mm -hmm. I've got to be in the right. top five you know right so, <laughs> So it's the same concept, right? With um, thinking of a good TED talk idea. And I think that's so valuable for people mm -hmm. who are, you know, I could do a talk on this or this, but it's all stuff that people have talked about before. Right. Um, you would have definitely when I've received things or uh, applications for my conferences or whatever, when the talk topic is unique and weird, I'm like, I have to talk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What? Yeah, I yeah. have to talk to that person. <laughs> and if it's just the seven that are the same, you know, there's probably three topics that everyone pitches and then there's a few outliers and I just right. grab onto the outliers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, were you going to say something? No, but um, so, so basically, I was just going to agree with you and basically say that, you know, um, it's the same thing and that makes the process more fun for everybody, right? Like mm -hmm. I had, when I was organizing, I had so much fun working with the people who had cool ideas, you know? Um, and it's the same thing with like the story that you tell in your, in your Ted talk, right? Like, especially at a women's event, if you get up there and are like, well, I was in debt and I was getting divorced and my kids hate me. And you know what I mean? Like if, if you get up and tell that story, that's something we've heard a million times before. If you get up and say something like, you know, um, I read this book that, um, acknowledge 30 years ago that acknowledged that presidents won't always be male. Well, that's really cool. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it makes the whole, it, it's fu more fun for the organizer. It's more fun for you. It's more fun for the audience. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of where the magic comes from. Yeah. A hundred percent. I love it. It's, it's a positioning thing. It's setting yourself apart. Right. Exactly. Um, so 
talk a, a little bit more about um, how you can prepare to do a talk once you've, you've thought of an idea, you've got it accepted. Is, is there, can you over prepare? What's the best way to prepare? That's awesome. I love, I love talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so preparing for a talk is like preparing to get up on stage and play music or get up on stage and act, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're talking about the most serious thing, your talk is a performance. Um, and really think of it that way. First of all, practicing in the mirror does not work because if you're used to looking at yourself while you're giving your talk, it will be jarring to not see yourself while you're giving your talk. Um, mm -hmm. Some of my favorite strategies, um, first of all, practicing is boring. And I say that as somebody who I used to make my living playing music. So practice, I hated practicing. I still hate practicing. It's boring. So um, be prepared for that and find ways to make it interesting. Um, one of the things that I did with my first talk was I would say it back and forth with my fiance and she would, um, I'd say a line and she would say it back as like whatever character, Robert De Niro, you know, whoever. Mm -hmm. And then I would, she would say it back. I'd have to keep going. I wouldn't be able to stop. I wouldn't be able to laugh. I, you know, and, and so that was fun. It was a really fun way to practice something I just kept saying, you know, another strategy is, um, distract yourself. So one of the things I used to do when I was preparing for a concert is I would get, I would memorize a piece of music and then I would watch TV as I was playing it. So I know that I can perform it wow. while I'm distracted. Um, you know, and, and it would be watch something that's like, you can kind of tune in and out, but if you can do something while you're distracted, it's the point of don't practice until you get it right. Practice till you can't get it wrong. All right. So it's not the old, um, throw it together and hope it's really, exactly. really got to be every piece has got to be correct. Do you exactly. get a, um, do you get a teleprompter or any of any sort or do you have to just remember it? Um, every, every TEDx is different. I've uh, seen teleprompters used and I've seen that go really, really wrong. So, um, it gets a bit robotic. Well, no, um, I've seen people really mess up with the teleprompter you know, just like lose their place in the teleprompter and then not be able to get on track because, you know, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so memorize your talk and at the same time, memorize it. But if you make a mistake, be able to know that you can get, like, make sure that you know the content well enough that you haven't just memorized the words you can get back on yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, put in contingencies there. Like if you mess up, make sure that you know that you can keep going. Yeah, that's a really good point. I used to do, I don't know if you know this, I used to do stand-up mm -hmm. comedy in New Zealand for a few years. Really? Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, I loved it. I really loved it. Um, and and that was the thing that I learned, right? Because you don't mm -hmm. just, you do have to memorize all the jokes. Like you have to yeah. memorize them. But you don't, re you don't really, sometimes things can go off. Sometimes you get a heckler. Something, sometimes you forget what you're going to say. So you have to have, have, mm -hmm. And this may not be the same as TEDx because it's a bit, bit of a different stage. But um, for me, I would memorize. I knew I had 10 jokes for 10 minutes, yeah. mm -hmm. whatever it was, mm -hmm. seven, seven minutes. And so I was like, there these 10. So I knew that it was grandma, dinosaur, yep. um, mm -hmm. something. Like I knew all of the jokes, na like names. And so I would yeah. be able to just riff off of the joke exactly. after a while. Um, yeah, so, so even if I got lost, I could just go, well, I'll just go back to dinosaur and then go, what's next? You know, it's exactly just, it's only 10 things. Um, and the other one was if I totally forgot, then it was just mm -hmm. like, you had to have a few things up your sleeve just to, yeah. you know, I'm just going to go hump the microphone for a minute while I remember what I was going to say, <laughs> like, whatever it was. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But that's, that's important. And I like that you mentioned that because it's not about just memorizing it and then hoping for the best. Because right. someone like mm -hmm. cough, someone coughs and you're like, oh no. Yeah, and, and then you get distracted in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because I actually, uh, Dory and I both took stand up comedy classes as, as a means right. of professional development. And so you're to it, it's such a good tool. Like if you have the time and the energy and the means to go take a stand up comedy class or even just get up in an open mic, mm -hmm. that's like the best tool that you can have for, for that. So that's awesome. That's something we have to talk more about. Yeah. <laughs>
totally totally it's such a fun part of my life and i left new zealand obviously and um didn't really i feel like in new zealand it's a kind of a side note but in new zealand it's um such a small pool of people yeah Mm -hmm. very quickly became well known and then i was like oh crap and then i had to go to australia and i was like less popular i got to like like, Mm -hmm. some level and i was like oh and now i'm like scared to try because you know we're doing the states or something right it's like there's so (laughs) it's such a massive ocean yeah i'm like oh just stay in my little pool thanks (laughs) (laughs) well it's funny because um when i was doing it i um I, you know, we would do like these bringer shows and in, 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 in New York, this is really common where in order to get up on stage, you have to bring a certain amount of people. So I was doing a bringer show and then Jim Gaffigan walked in and did a 20 what? minute set before I was supposed to go on. Whoa. <laughs> and like, you would think like, that's oh, cool. a lot of pressure. Yeah. So like Jim Gaffigan opened for me, first of all, second of all, nobody wanted to hear from little old me after Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> They all got up to get a drink. They're like, that was worth the night. Yeah, that's exactly. amazing. Oh, I love no. that guy. So funny. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> um, well, so, okay. We do need to talk about all that stuff yes. later. Um, so is, what, what else about um, being on the stage or maybe preparing or anything about that? Is there anything else that you would warn people about or that they should think about? Yeah, so... Um, be aware that every organizer is free to sort of work within the parameters that Ted has laid out for them. Mm -hmm. So be open to anything, you know, really, really be aware that you're walking into a situation that means a lot to you, but it also means a lot to the organizer and to every other speaker there. So um, really, really expect anything be supportive, be open. That's so important. I mean, I, it sounds obvious, but I've been in situations where I've seen, you know, speakers kind of get into that situation and not realize how important it was to them, you know, and things like that. So be mentally and and emotionally prepared for it. Um, Have fun with it. You know, see if there's, even if you do something crazy on stage, like that's, you know, this is your opportunity. It's not a keynote. It's not your, your corporate client, you know, um, like I, I wore roller skates on stage for my exercise talk and what? now, pe- yeah. Cause I was playing roller derby at the time and like, I was able to tie it in and, you know, talk about my experience and like chart my economic growth as I was working out and stuff like that. Um, so I wore my skates on stage and now people talk to me about, they're like, oh yeah, you're the girl that did, did your talk in roller skates, right? And so if you, if you have something interesting that you could do, do it, you know, like by all means, have fun with it. Don't forget to have fun with it, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's my advice. That's some like, that's super fun because, and I didn't know that, you know, I didn't even think about that people bombed their TED Talk, you know, there's people who like totally screw it up with the, the, um, the video visual cues and things like yeah. that. Um, let alone, I guess, on the other end, that you can do fun stuff to make it different. Yeah. All the ones I've ever seen, they're standing there. It's a bit dry. It's mm-hmm. sometimes it's kind of like, okay, cool. That was your. It's what is it, eighteen minutes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, and I didn't think that you could do mix it up that much. I mean, I'm sure you'd have to ask the organizer to, and make sure yeah. that it was legit. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. I'm sure that's got a lot of people, um, thinking about what they might do to, to be a bit different and yeah. memorable. Um, so hopefully we'll see lots of fun Ted talks come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> so are your, um, talks, are they on YouTube or how, where are they? So, um, my talks are on, on the YouTube, the TEDx YouTube, and I was lucky enough to have both my talks also be put on TED.com. Damn. Girl. So. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, what I'm seeing is that they're trending toward, it used to be that they would just pick up one talk here and there. Now what they're doing is they're, they're choosing a specific event and all of those talks to go on um, TED.com. So my events, um, the event that I organized, all, all of those talks are on TED. Um, wow. so, so the great thing about this is that, you know, it doesn't matter what event you speak at. It doesn't, yes, the, the audience in the room matters, but it doesn't matter 
as much as the global reach that you could potentially have. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you speak at a first year event that has a low budget and everything else, you could go to TED.com. Like that's, that's the real value here, you know? Um, and, and if you get to TED.com, that's the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Well, um, going back to the first question that I asked, you know, why would you do a TED talk? The amount of credibility that you get from doing one of these Mm -hmm. talks is insane. And let's talk for a minute about how you leverage that credibility. Cause you could just have a talk and yeah. be like, diddly do I've done a talk, mm-hmm. but yeah. you could also turn it into tons of opportunities. How have Absolutely. you done that and how can people do that? So um, my, my situation is pretty specific because I make part of my living with this. So um, right away I saw the gains, right? Like right away people were like, Oh, you've done a Ted talk and you pitch people. Cool. I can, I, you know, mm-hmm. there's no reason not to work with you. Right. But, um, if you can leverage your talk, I would call it an unofficial funnel, right? Like you can't actually use it for a funnel, but if you release your talk, if your talk comes out and then two months later, your book comes out or your talk comes out and you coordinate releasing a service, um, or your talk comes out and you build a new business on, on, on the back of that, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's a really good way, first of all, share it on social media, you know, treat it like a book launch. So, you know, views matter, that kind of thing matters. Um, have, have your friends and family comment and everything like that, that boosts you in the algorithm. Um, and then really think about what you're gonna do next because you're right like the video comes out, that's the end for a lot of people, but it should actually be the beginning. 100%. I say that all the time about, yeah, you're comparing with books. It's exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's like people write the book and then they're like, oh crap. I've got, how do I, (laughs) how do I market this? How do I use this? Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, I talk about a lot is content repurposing. Mm -hmm. Are are you allowed to chop it into pieces and use clips of it for your social media and stuff like that? Um, I think the official rule is that you can use 30 seconds of it. Um, But I've seen, I've seen people use it in their speaker reels and other things like that. So um, up up to 30 seconds. Yeah. And I've, I've seen, I've seen, you know, unofficially speaking, I, you know, I'll deny having said this, but I see people use it all the time. You know, I see it double as speaker reels. I see longer clips in people's speaker reels. I see them use it on social media. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's absolutely a valuable thing and like share it as much as you can on social media because that's where people Mm -hmm. find you these days. Mm -hmm. hundred percent, you know, repurposing on social media and things like, um, you know, using a picture of you you on the TED stage as your cover photo or mm-hmm. as your Twitter, mm-hmm. Twitter header or like whatever yeah. it is that you use, people forget that you can do that. Put the logo on your website. Right. Um, yeah. There's so many things that you can do with it. Have you, has, have you leveraged it in any other ways? Shouldn't think of um, yeah. So, so one of the big things, one of the big ways that I've been able to leverage it is um, it's, it's, it really is a credibility call when it comes to publishers. Mm. So even, even just saying that right to a fiction publisher, having that in my, in, in my, um, in my uh, signature has really helped. Right. So like, I don't even have to say it, it's just there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've leveraged it to write a book. I've leveraged it to, you know, really build out services and things like that. Um, And, you know, so in, in our field, right, with online entrepreneurs, it might seem like, yeah, everybody's giving a TED Talk. What do I need to? But the truth is that it matters. You know, um, your publisher is going to look at that. Your, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So here's, here's an ancillary way that this is, has worked out for me. Um, I'm making a little bit of a pivot, not really a pivot, but I'm uh, starting to get back into the uh, commercial theater realm and um, starting to do some creative stuff there. And so I've been creating a podcast uh, with Broadway producers and actors and things like that. And I keep my TEDx in my signature, like make no mistake about it. And they see that and that's a credibility marker for them. It doesn't even matter that it's not the same, you know, it's, it's not the same field. It's not it's like, I've been on the phone with three people today. They've all asked me about my TED talk. So that's that's I don't know if, if that answers your question totally but <laughs> it does that's, 
it's super helpful. It's super helpful for people to know because the next, my next question is about, you know, what, as good as it is, what stops people from taking, making the leap into doing it? You know, like it's yeah. got such upsides and I'm mm -hmm. one of the people that hasn't done it. And for whatever reason, yeah. and um, there's so many reasons to do it. What's the, f I mean, and there's people applying obviously who want to do it and I, applying correctly or whatever but mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who say that they want to do it it's on the bucket list one day one day one day one day yep. and <laughs> they haven't done it so what's that thing that stops people and how can they overcome it do you think that's a great question and the number one answer that I find is imposter syndrome you know everybody's like mm -hmm. oh who am I you know not now I'm not famous yet I'm not my following's not big enough I'm not you know mm -hmm. experienced enough Nobody knew who Simon Sinek was before Start With Why. Nobody knew who Brene Brown was before um, The Power of Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. no, nobody knew who Mel Robbins was before Stop Screwing Yourself Over. You know, yeah. so, so TED, TEDx launched them. And so you, you don't have to be famous to do this. Like, and in fact, I, I think you shouldn't be famous to do this, right? Because this is the time to use that platform rather than already being famous and wow, I don't care if I do a TED talk. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's great. Imposter syndrome is, it just keeps coming up over all the things that we've talked talking about at the summit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, and you're right. It's because people are just thinking that they're not there yet. One day they'll be in the right place to do this thing. Right. Right. Exactly. We've, we've talked about it with TEDx, we've talked about it with writing books. Talked about yeah, it, yeah. Creating, creating a podcast, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All these things. Um, well, so uh, I'm going to put the links to all the stuff below this video, but where can people actually, let me ask you first, how can people work with you? What is your, what does your business look like in terms of how can you help people to do a TED talk? It's a great question. So um, I have a few, a few modes of working. So um, I alluded to um, my partnership with uh, that speaker, Elaine Bennett. Um, she and I just pivoted in, in light of COVID and we created sort of a lower, a lower price offering called the TEDx happy hour. It's basically an online course and then you get to get up and give a five minute version of your TED talk. Um, on, yeah. And it's all via Zoom and everything. It's, it's really easy and it's really fun. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, and then um, my, my signature offering for TEDx is a soup to nuts, all encompass thing. So um, I take you from the idea all the way to getting you on that stage. Um, and that includes getting nice. your pitch materials together, brainstorming, coaching sessions. And then my team goes off to the races and pitches you. And then any final round, any additional support that you need, you have me personally helping you along the way. Damn, that sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, we're going to put the link for that stuff mm -hmm. um, underneath the video. I'm sure you have people that want to work with you. Uh, do you have awesome. room to have people work with you right now? I do. I'm, uh, I'm really lucky. I have a, a great team. So, so you know, cool. they handle the pitching and then I handle the coaching and everything like that. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, and where can people find out? For, actually, I'm going to put the links for other things, but where can people follow you on social media? Um, the best place is LinkedIn. Um, it's LinkedIn, uh, slash in slash Maureen Contrera. Um, find me on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. My Twitter is a little dire, but, uh, the rest of my, <laughs> my social profiles are, are uh, pretty active. And, um, I remember Twitter exists like every four months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Perfect. Um, I got that. So we'll have that below. Listen, Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Oh, thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you.